Okay. Good evening, everybody, or good morning, depending on where you are logging in from. Um, my name is Vijay Sambamurthy. I am the founder and manager. energy and infrastructure projects, uh, and in particular, rene renewable energy projects. And I will be chairing this session today. And the session is on COVID and renew renewable energy. As the topic suggests, we're going to be talking about uh, the increasing, and uh, I should say ever increasing uh, popularity and role of renewable energy in the world, and uh, especially in the context of the recent presidential election and the change in administration, what it means for renewable energy projects. And uh, we are also going to be focusing on whether COVID and the pandemic situation uh, have, uh, you know, impacted the, you know, march of the renewable uh, energy projects worldwide or has it impeded it or has it not affected it in any way. These are all very interesting and relevant questions for us to deal with. And, uh, you know, what is interesting to me is that uh, over the last decade in particular, renewable energy has started becoming more and more relevant. Uh, I think we had a very, uh, you know, uh, uh, interesting period, especially in the United States, when, uh, you know, fossil fuel based ENP activity picked up in a big way because of, uh, you know, the sudden popularity spurred by techniques like fracking. And you know, while, while that is interesting as well, uh, the, and we, as we all understand, uh, you know, uh, those are smarter ways to extract more out of planet Earth. But, uh, you know, we have an infinite capacity to consume energy and there are finite resources which cannot be renewed, which are fossil fuels. So while uh, techniques to, you know, exploit more and more and better and better, more efficient fossil fuels, can be a good strategy in the short term. It's not going to, you know, last very long. So therefore, renewable energies uh, becomes even more important. And increasingly, I think more and more governments worldwide are giving more legitimate uh, recognition to that. And the heartening part is we are seeing even private equity funds and corporations worldwide uh, placing a lot of emphasis on, you know, sustainable development goals and ESG. Uh, and factors like that in making their investment decisions. So with that background, I think it's very pertinent to look at how renewable energy is going to be impacted, if at all, by COVID and all the recent developments in the space. To address this, we have a very, very accomplished uh, panel here. So first we have uh, Claire Coven. Uh, Claire is the CEO of uh, Cahill International and Cahill Energy. Uh, she has a medical background in radiation physics, and she has built six successful startups from scratch. She's also had, uh, you know, an avatar as an investment banker. So all this diverse experience has, you know, uh, helped her in building a 40 megawatt waste to uh, energy plant in the Caribbean, which she sold for $350 million to Quantum Energy. And I, I, I believe that Claire will be talking about uh, this. Uh, I think she's planning to announce her next renewable energy uh, project today on the RSS Forum. So welcome, Claire, to the session. Uh, the next speaker we have is uh, Charles Tang. Charles is the chairman of the uh, Brazil-China Chamber of Commerce, and he's also the president of uh, ABERH, the Brazilian Association of Waste to Energy and Hydrogen. And he's also, uh, so he also continues to serve and has served on several such roles on a cross-border basis, uh, including with specific focus on Brazil and in China. Charles was a member of the World Policy Institute of New York before he moved to Brazil. And he's credited with uh, introducing leasing in its early stages into Brazil as an executive of the Bank of Boston. And he's often quoted by you know, reputable publications around the world on various subjects. So welcome, Charles, to the panel as well. 
We have also Geeta Sankapanavar. She is the founder and CEO of Akira Impact, which is an essential assets investment firm that invests to support uh, UNSDG. She is recognized as an international thought leader and unrelenting advocate for women's equality and rights, a committed philanthropist, and she's been honored as one of Canada's top 100 most powerful women. Geeta serves on the boards of numerous organizations including as the chair of the board of governors of the University of Calgary as a board member of the Univers- uh, of UNICEF Canada as well. So uh, Geeta uh, welcome to the panel we look forward to hearing your perspectives as well. We next have Neil Sumaru. Neil is the CEO of uh, Lotus Americas LLC. Uh you know uh, lotus americas has a global platform which facilitates trade in three verticals uh, the first is healthcare and life sciences the second is finance and the third is energy and smart mobility neil apart from lotus americas is also involved in running a couple of other organizations uh, which relate to waste management and disinfection and so on lastly uh we have a very interesting speaker in Marina Shmatova Marina graduated from the Moscow Geological Research University with a specialization in mining of rare and radioactive metals for the uh, for the last several months she's been based in Mozambique uh, possibly on a false lockdown and she started working there with investment funds and uh, and Uh, amazingly in this short period has managed to close over 1 billion of investments into the energy sector in Mozambique and she is very passionate about the topic of africa and of waste management and she's uh, you know got some initiatives going already in Mozambique and in the rest of africa so with that i'm going to you know move on to this panel are all of you ready for your questions So the first question I had was a generic one for all of you which is kind of directly related to you know the topic we are here to speak about so as as I mentioned in my initial remarks renewable energy has been you know exponentially growing in popularity uh, you know around the world and uh, with the recent change in the you know administration in the United States uh, and with president Biden's administration reaffirming its commitment to uh, you know bringing the us you know back into a major leadership role on climate change renewable energy is in fact expected to become even more important than it already has been over the last decade and it's going to become more pervasive and you know uh, affect us in various wa- ways more uh, more positive than negative i would like to believe but the question i would like to pose for this panel is given all this context and background how does covid change or influence the march of the renewable energy brigade as well so to answer this so on this question i would like to take uh, you know views from everybody uh, and i would request everybody to kind of keep the uh, responses to 3 minutes or under because we'd like to get the best out of everybody's experience on this so Uh, may I request Claire to take this question first? It helps I if I unmute myself. <laughs> it, yeah, uh, I think that COVID-19 uh, was a game changer for renewable energy. Uh, the timing couldn't have been more uh, impeccable. Uh, there were a lot of things that all seemed to come together at the same time as covid-19 and you know sometimes when you lose your footing uh, that's when you find it again <laughs> and i really do think that the situation in the united states uh with uh trump at the time uh i I dare not say this but I'm going to say it. <laughs> I think it was uh for all of our benefit uh that he dropped out of the Paris Accord uh because it forced all the other world leaders 
to take a stand and figure out what they were going to do and, and not necessarily follow one leadership pattern. Uh, and they had to demonstrate for themselves. And, you know, if you look at what France has done, what Germany's done, what Italy's done, uh, it's amazing. And I'm not so sure those initiatives would have taken place uh, without the absence of the U.S. because we all tend to follow uh, wherever the U.S. goes. So I think that was a good thing. I also think COVID was a real benefit because in the news, everywhere you looked, it showed what the decrease of CO2 in our atmosphere looked like. It, to see uh, the numbers going down, down, down. Uh, I don't think we would have seen that if we all weren't staying at home. Uh, our cars weren't running, uh, all of the things that contribute uh, to that. So uh, in my opinion, I do think that the United States coming on board now uh, will be great. Uh, but I also think all of the countries of the world have had a chance to establish their own leadership and that's a very good thing. And I think that if you look at the numbers on uh, renewable energy, uh, they're staggering uh, what's happening now. So I think COVID-19, there's one positive vote for COVID-19. <laughs> I'll let you go ahead. Thank you, Claire. That was very, very insightful. There's one positive and that positive is the push towards renewable energy, I guess. And I'd, I'm, I'm uh, curious to get Charles' take on this question uh, coming, uh, you know, from your point of view in Brazil, Charles. Take your mute button off, Charles. <laughs> yes. That's right. Okay. Brazil has always been a uh, clean energy country. Brazil has always been very well known for its, you know, hydropower, you know, percentage of hydropower electric uh, utilization. And Brazil about 50 years ago instituted the ethanol program, whereby most cars in Brazil run 100% up to 100% on ethanol. Of course, Brazil has also become one of the major petroleum exporters to China. Now, as the uh, chairman of the Brazil-China Chamber of Commerce, we are attracting a lot of Chinese companies to invest in the hydroelectric power plants. Uh, I, I brought the president of the second largest power generation company in China to look at a 1.5 gigawatt LNG uh, thermoelectric power plant. We are now attracting Chinese investors on two gigabytes of solar power. One project is a 1.2 gigabyte and the other project is five uh, projects close to each other, totaling 870 megawatts. And as the chairman of the Brazil, I mean, Brazilian Association of Waste to Energy and Hydrogen, you know, Brazil is a virgin country for waste to energy, whereas China in the last decade created 450 new waste to energy plants. We have 5,568 mayors in Brazil that are all outlaws because no, none of them, you know, have been able to meet the requirements, legal requirements for waste treatment. We would like to change that because we are going to, we are now promoting, we're talking to a, a major uh, state capital city and the suburban areas around it to, uh, which told about one and a half million people <clears throat> to build a waste to energy plant. And we're talking to several other municipalities to build waste to energy plants. So, you know, you can build hundreds of waste energy plants in Brazil, 
because there are none, not at least none that is on the commercial scale. We have some pilot pilot uh, projects, and uh, <clears throat> we're also very much into hydrogen, because as we know, uh, in the future, I think we will be basically talking about hydrogen. We're talking to uh, a group that is researching and, and building, uh, going to build a model of hydrogen powered drones and airplanes. Uh, and of course, China and uh, in China, you have large fleets of trucks that run on hydrogen. So, however, in Brazil, it's just starting. It, there is nothing really, there's one, you know, one or two plants that are small and basically demonstration plants. And uh, we believe that we can help our association, can help Brazil develop and clean up the pollution and transform a big headache, pollution headache into revenue and renewable energy, which is waste to energy. Of course, we were, we're talking to the Inter-American Development Bank and other, and we talked to Claire and other uh, banks to help finance. And of course, the Chinese companies coming in, they, they, they don't need any financing. They, they do their own financing. So, so that's basically what we're up to. And we believe that uh, we can contribute to Joe Biden's clean energy uh, program to transform you know, get rid of the fossil fuels. Uh, and of course, it, the fossil fuels will still be around for a long time. But it's like AJ said, it's a finite resource. And we do have to clear up the world's climate and ecology. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. That's very fascinating. And, uh, you know, since you talked about hydrogen, I must interject and mention that even in India, uh, our, our government just announced this grand project called the National Hydrogen Mission, which is like a, a you know a giant partnership between the government and all the major private sector uh, companies. So this is, I think, more and more countries are going to adopt hydrogen. I think in a big way. With that, I will uh, you know uh, ask Geeta to come in and uh, weigh in with her views on this question. Over to you, Geeta. Thanks, Vijay. Um, I, I resonate with a lot of what Charles said. Um, so, so I think what COVID has done has only accelerated the transition to clean energy. So it used to be an economic argument and it became a morals argument. Now it's over. So I think every generation you have kind of a once in a, in a generation opportunity to, to change. And that's either based off of technology, it's based off of policy, or it's based off of human call to action. And I think what we've seen during COVID is a mixture of all of these, which has only accelerated capital into the space and started to drive more and more adoption. The generation question is over. It's been already proven. Um, solar and wind in the cheapest areas in the world, are sub three cents, and in, in the best areas in the world, are sub three cents per kilowatt hour. So now the only question to figure out right now is storage. And, and like Charles, um, I'm an investor on both ends of the grid and storage. So I, I um, control the development rights for a 500 megawatt pumped hydro storage facility in California, um, as well as um, an investor in distributed solar and mission critical power systems. And so there's a lot of stuff happening here that is, is really interesting. But I think as we look at it from a timeline perspective, and I think, again, I'll, I'll just refer to, to what Charles is saying, what we're seeing is it's no longer just economics. It's about viewing sustainability as a mix of water, waste, clean power, and agriculture, and how they can actually come together to build a more sustainable world. And when you look at that, what you actually end up seeing is all of a sudden a renewed investment in waste to energy. I've invested now in, in the last year in multiple waste to energy projects where we're getting over eighty dollars a GJ on um, on on RNG, and so there's there's some really interesting projects out there and some really interesting um, uh, uh, contracts. But I think we're in inning one of a nine inning stretch, and as more and more 
consumers and corporates start um, adopting more and more ESG principles just the way that allocators are today, uh, as we've seen in the largest sovereign wealth funds in the world, what we're going to start seeing is more and more advancement in um, in capital going into this space. So, so I, I, I definitely agree with that. That's, uh, that's my view. Thank you for that, Gita. Absolutely. It's good to see some alignment on the basic uh, you know, uh, team on this. But of course, we have two more speakers. And I'm curious to know what their take on this is. So let's go to Neil next. Uh, Neil, what are your uh, thoughts on the question? Yeah, thanks, BJ. Uh Hopefully I don't echo too much what's been said because there, there's definitely agreement uh, so far on this panel. But, um, you know, there's a couple of things. I think I, I fully agree that I think this COVID era has um, made us really hyper aware of um, the decrease in overall energy consumption and demand. Uh, coupled with the increase in renewables. Um, and I think that uh, market factors, to Claire's point, are absolutely right right now for this to be uh, precedent setting. Uh, policy wise, uh, about nine days ago, uh, you know, we saw some um, congressional initiatives put forward uh, in the US um, in terms of tax credits being applied to storage. Um, our focus, largely as a company, is on the storage size side of this business. We have um, some of the best um, um, storage cells for EV and power storage, um, uh, you know, in the world, uh, largely produced out of Asia. Um, and, and uh, you know, to echo a little bit of what Charles was saying in Brazil, um, I truly believe what we've seen in the COVID era specifically is um, access to creating really smart hybrid corridors of trade between some of the Asian countries and uh, creating a domestic presence within the United States. Um, what I mean specifically by that is um, um, that we have, you know, uh, some technology partners uh, out of uh, the Eastern world. Uh, we've got a need for reliance on domestic production, and we've seen this happen in multiple different industries in the COVID era, where we our supply chains that were too reliant on one part of the world have suffered. Uh, and so I think there's a real need for how do we not only create better grid infrastructure with power, but I think with uh, utilizing the proper storage, as I kind of said, the fourth pillar of energy, um, um, I think there's a, a truly a immense opportunity to monetize that. Um, and I think that's really where we're going to see um, probably in the next, you know, 10 to 15 years. Uh, probably in the U.S. market, a large push for capturing and monetizing or re-monetizing uh, energy through storage. Um, so, you know, for, for our company, that's really where the focus is. We've got um, partnerships with eHang, which is an autonomous drone that uses some of our batteries uh, right now in China and uh, uh, UAE. Um, we're in conversations with U.S. companies right now. Um, um, that we can partner with, you know, in terms of manufacturing, production, supply, and entering those markets. So um, I'll speak to it a little bit later as well, Jay, but, you know, there's some interesting elements here where, where we play in the financial fintech space as well. And what we've done from a commodities perspective is tokenized um, proven reserves of assets, minerals, or commodities. And I think there's potentially an opportunity to create a whole ecosystem of trade uh, with, you know, the increased demand on things like lithium as a commodity, as we see sort of storage and um, um, renewable energy sort of take more of a, a precedent uh, in North America and the world. Thank you, Neil. Those were very fascinating and very relevant insights. And lastly, uh, I'm going to ask Marina to speak on this point uh, from her unique uh, perspective of Russia and Mozambique. Marina. Thank you. Happy to, happy to welcome everyone. I, as you know uh, from my speech of last year at the Forum, I was locked down in Mozambique uh, before the pandemic. The emergency period lasted more than half a year. This allowed me to immerse myself with little the implementation of the renewable and alternative energy cooperation program in Africa. The severe the global crisis in the world in the market market has drawn the uh, the attention of 
World Investor of Africa. I had the opportunity to keep uh, to keep abreast of development and the assets for the for the potential of the sector of this economic the economic ground. As alternative, um, I was also I was also shocked uh, uh, the serious problem of the pollution in the environment by solid and uh, and and the liquid with domestic to, to the industrial vessel. We took note uh, of the piles of uh, garbage and, and discussed with local municipalities for a program to connect this garbage into energy. Together with colleagues, with colleagues, we started the program to select technology, technology that uh, the world allowed to, to, to maximize this converted, converted this, this waste to energy or blast necessary for this region. And um, in, the, in the light uh, average in annual temperature, temperature and humid and and the, uh, in the, in the humid climate in this region have made uh, landfill and the ser and serious ecological problem. problem. The, the global the global pandemic has clever to show to show the, uh, how quickly viruses mutate. And what danger our our com, our common neglect to to the environment pro, um, poses and in, into uh, the human human of variables. Our specialists have selected the technology for for this for the sector. And I'm introduced more, more than one one billion. Uh, and I'm introduced more than one billion uh, dollar for for this sector. Well, that's absolutely fascinating, Marina. Uh, I think you, you, Marina is probably having internet issues, but we, we uh, you know, at least got the bulk of her perspectives on this point, which were pretty valuable because uh, effectively uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff she's working on in Mozambique, uh, you know, in the waste management space, and uh, sh you know, she is. Uh, it's it's no mean feat to have attracted a billion dollars in capital in such a short period of forced lockdown in, in Mozambique. I think it's really fascinating. And uh, so now I'm going to move to the second part of this uh, session, which is, uh, you know, I'm going to throw some specific questions uh, to each of you based on your respective, you know, backgrounds and preferences. And, uh, you know, I'd love to get your perspectives on this. So now we're going to start with uh, you, Gita. And, uh, you know, I know that you've been a, a investor in this uh, space and renewables in particular since 2016. So I would like to get your, uh, you know, sense as to where you see capital flowing in the sector. Do you think that uh, events like the outages in Texas or the rolling brownouts in uh, California are going to have an adverse impact uh, on the availability of capital in the renewable space in general? Or do you think they're not going to be a problem? Yeah, thank you. Great question. Um, I, I think it's actually going to direct capital to a specific subsector. So I think when it's going to be all around storage, storage from a distributed size, uh, utility scale, um, EV, anything micro storage all the way up to microgrids to utility scale. I think that is where the primary source of capital is now getting directed. I think solar and wind right now has become uh, a simple EPC plus um, a PPA attached to it. And so it's now getting developed in all sorts of um, fashion and all sorts of scale. And with uh, the PURPA regulations in the United States, it's actually quite easy to get a sub 20, uh, $20 million, 20 megawatt project uh, developed on a generation side. I think where smart capital is starting to really focus on is in two areas. One is storage, as I just mentioned. Um, and then the other is thinking about what happens um, when the path of the electron is disrupted. And so um, on storage specifically, I think it is it, it, what I've done is uh, five years ago, I, I took over the development rights for um, utility scale hydro in, in California and just slowly waited and developed. And over time now with the Biden um, administration in place, it has become quite interesting to have long duration, you know, 13 hour block start storage available. 
But I think that project has um, a very finite amount of time to be developed within. And so, um, because the second area that people have been investing in is alternative sources of distributed uh, storage. And I'm also an investor in that. And so I'll give you an example. Um, if you can put in place uh, distributed storage systems, whether it's a combination of short-term battery, whether it's a mix of um, short-term black start lithium-ion battery plus gas power generation modulation um, attached to it, you can literally take and decentralize um, energy. And so one of the investments that we're just finishing right now is an investment in mission critical power storage, where we have 10 year infrastructure contracts um, with, that are basically a second derivative on investment grade counterparties um, because they're attached to data centers, but then they are connected into, they're, they're grid interconnected. And so you can actually lower the, the recycle ratio of, um, of, of carbon in utilities by actually connecting directly to the grid and therefore only having to, to go long and there's an area needed. Marina, you may want to mute yourself. Um, Sorry, there was, a bit, there was a bit net network. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we have more than two, two seconds here. And it's, it's really, I, I, I'm sorry. And now I, I, I want to talk about the, the, the uh, Mozambique it has a very big location because we're connected with more than seven countries here. And, and they have the. No problem. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same world. Yeah. 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 world. Now, we have, now we have construction and energy hub here. And, and I'm. I'm I, Get this more than one, one or two billion invest and in that's for there. And by, I'm inviting all, all of you <laughs> to work with, with this Africa because it's a great, great market for that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sorry. No problem. Sorry. Just to, just to yeah. wrap, up, wrap up my point, um, I think what's really interesting here is um, as you think about where this is going to go. As, as utility scale um, storage, as utility scale generation starts to see a greater and greater burden on transmission and distribution because more and more um, entities, commercial and residential, come off the grid with their own um, connected uh, power systems for, for generation plus storage. What I think you're going to end up seeing is um, a real interest in, in decarbonizing, which actually allows this. You know, I actually think there's a bit of an echo. I'll, I'll probably stop here. Maybe we can. Sure. Thank, thank you for that, Gita. And sorry about that. Uh, Marina, can, can, can you please mute yourself if you don't mind? Because uh, when you're not speaking, so that others don't get an echo. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know where my speech stopped because, because I lost my connection. Uh, no problem, no problem. Uh, so uh, I'm going to ask the next question to Neil. And, uh, you know, I just as a housekeeping point, we have about 12 minutes left in the session. And so uh, I'm going to request everybody to kind of crunch down your answers. Apologies for that, but we have a 45 minute session with uh, lots of very valuable, uh, you know, experience and insights around the table. So I'm going to ask Neil this question. You talked about this very, uh, you made this very interesting point in the first, uh, uh, you know, part of your session. Uh, you also talked about the storage problem that Gita has uh, talked about in great detail. And I agree, it's a big, big challenge. And uh, you also talked about the synergies between, uh, you know, North America, U.S., with Asia. So, so can you just talk about a little more on that? Uh, but uh, may I request you to keep your response a little uh, shorter than usual, say two minutes or so. Thank you. Uh, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll be pretty brief, but, um, uh, you know, for, for us, I think what COVID is, you know, to the point of sort of our, our conversation topic, I think what COVID has really shown us is that, um, there needs to be better global collaboration, especially with our supply chains. And, and when I look at even things like, you know, power consumption and, and uh, you know, um, you know, the issues even that we saw in Texas, right, with the blackouts and the brownouts, um, a lot of it comes down to how we utilize the storage capacity better. And I think we, right now, it seems at least domestically within the United States, we have a very strong lens, not just on uh, energy, but in a lot of sectors of 
bringing things more domestic in terms of production. And sometimes my, my thought around it or my fear around it is that I just don't want us as a region to close our doors to some of the possibilities, the trade corridors that exist with technology that's being developed in other parts of the world, whether it's Mozambique or Europe or China. There's some brilliant infrastructure coming out of China right now, uh, technology, but for uh, you know certain political reasons, sometimes it can be a challenging geographical um, place to work with. But I, I think that if we're smart and we look at how do we create really, truly hybridized corridors of trade where um, um, we do things that are beneficial, not to necessarily just the political agendas in front of us, but truly the problem of solving power uh, as a global need with the right storage and better infrastructure, uh, avoiding the duck curve that happens in every country, every single day in every city, uh, all of that can be mitigated by better storage. Um, and then what I'm really interested in is also how do we better monetize that? Because of course there's gonna be a direct impact with job creation and revenue creation, um, just in the conventional sense of you know, better power, cheaper cost and, and more distribution. But I think that being able to sort of take that macro level look of how, when we have better storage and, and sort of lack of better term, but cheaper power uh, infrastructure through solar and wind and other avenues, um, what are the opportunities to monetize that? So the macro level of monetization, uh, whether that's in the home or on a commercial level, um, how can there be sort of re inputting that power into the grid, storing it? Um, and, you know, so that's, that's really what I was kind of looking at is you know, I just want to make sure or our focus as a company is to make sure we're, we're looking at the, the fabric of the problem and not just uh, uh, and, and how do we really create better solutions and not closing our eyes and our business lens to some of the amazing opportunities in other parts of the world. Uh, sure. That may it help us domestically as well. Thank you, thank you, Neil. That's pretty fascinating. I'll, I'll move next to Claire again. So, Claire, I know you've done a lot of these, you know, big renewable energy projects, uh, including your, uh, you know, uh, in, including the Caribbean one, which you sold uh, for three fifty million. But I know your real passion is about solving for the small guys. Uh, so I know that you have some plans about. Uh, you know, uh, a new fund. So would you like to uh, talk about that and, you know, why exactly you're doing this? But of course, in a, in a, in a very short span of time, because we're running out of time. Thank you. You're on mute. EJ, I'm waiting for you to say, do that in about 20 seconds. <laughs> So I'm going to be very uh, brief. I think uh, this exact moment in time uh, is uh, just so unbelievable. Uh, I got into waste to energy. I've been an investment banker for 20 years. And uh, in 2012, I read about waste to energy, my background's in physics, and I thought, this has got to be nuts. There's no way this is real. So the more I read about it, then I said, oh, my God, it is real. This does follow the law of physics. Suffice it to say, uh, I've learned about renewable energy from the ground up, from knowing nothing, not being an engineer, uh, into developing major projects around the world. And I think that we support two megawatts, five megawatts, 10 megawatts, investing in that. I'll come to you guys for the storage. <laughs> but I think the uh, the part for me isn't about that. It's about the platform we're creating to engage mankind into renewal energy. Give him his dopamine hits through renewable energy. Uh, that's what I'm uh, 
planning on, uh, but I don't want to take any more uh, time because we haven't heard from Charles yet or the audience. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you, Claire. I think the essence of what you're saying is there is merit and beauty in small projects, monetizable beauty in small projects, and I'd love to take you up offline on that. Charles, uh, I wanted to understand a little more about the hydrogen project that you are, uh, you know, that you've already touched upon. And do you see, uh, you know, for example, do you see uh, Brazil? Uh, one thing that struck me is there are three representatives on this panel from the BRIC countries, right? So where do you see China, the fourth one, which is not uh, theoretically present here, where do you see them in this whole renewable energy, uh, you know, in a real <laughs> Well, China is the leading country in the world for renewable energy. So, uh, you know, like I said, you know, no other country in the world has as much renewable energy as China does. And it's also a leading, leading in the uh, renewable energy technology. So, uh, right. I also agree with Jita and Neil about the storage. And that's why we're, closing in on several major lithium, copper, and zinc reserves in Brazil. As you know, Brazil, you know, you have so many different mines and reserves that you can trip over. You know, I I, I had uh, two mining reserves that uh, they were, you can walk over pure solid manganese and, and, and iron ore and things like that. So, uh, so I think that uh, to be able to have storage, you must have lithium, you must have nickel, and for transmission, you must have copper. Without these, you can't even talk about storage. So we're basically concentrating now. Uh, that's not the chamber business. In a sense, it is because the Brazil-China chamber also attracts capital, Chinese capital mainly, to invest in these mining operations. But also, I, I also have a, a mineral reserve company that we basically find the reserves, and then we, you know, develop them a bit, and we get companies to join venture to explore the mine and transform these reserves into mines. Okay, so uh, I think it's very important, and in terms of hydrogen. Uh, we we plan to establish maybe a first commercial scale together with Brazilian and Chinese partners or actually partners from anywhere in the world. It's just that <clears throat> although I was in investment banking on Wall Street, I've been in Brazil for so many years. So I do a lot of business between United States, Brazil and China. Mm -hmm. So you know, uh, we should also concentrate on attracting U.S. Uh, participants in absolutely. what they're doing. Absolutely. And also in India, you know, you could help us bring India uh, interest into what we're doing in Brazil. It's definitely very, very, um, you know, high profile right now in India. Like I mentioned, you know, we have a government program, it's huge. So we would be definitely interested in talking about that. Great. And I think we literally have one minute. There's a quick question from Jen in the audience. Uh, the question is, uh, speak as to entrepreneurship in the space of renewable energy. I think, I don't know if anyone in particular wants to take that and all that. We don't have time. Uh, uh, you know, I don't know if we have time. But Jen, what I would certainly urge you to do is to reach out to all of us uh, privately, uh, you know, through the platform. Um, and we'll be, you know, delighted to have a discussion. Uh, but I wanted to take a minute to thank, uh, you know, all the speakers for for being here and and all the members of the audience for being here as well and this has been a fascinating discussion i think uh, you know each of us has brought our respective perspectives and you know uh, experiences and uh, thank you very much this has been a very very useful session on a very important topic and uh, with that i think we have run out of time now so it's time to say goodbye, but a pleasure being here with all of you. Uh, and and uh, I look forward to doing this again sometime soon. Bye. Thanks, Jay.